Hi folks, this is Lee W. Mowen, the host of the Cincinnati Dayton Sports Podcast. I've been hosting my podcast on Anchor for some time now, and let me tell you why it's the easiest way to make a podcast. When you host with Anchor, you have creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your computer or phone. Anchor then distributes your podcast for you so others can listen on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more platforms. You can even make some money with your podcast with no minimum listenership required. And best of all, it's 100% free. It truly is the one-stop shop for those looking to start a podcast. To start, download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Anchor. Give it up for day four of Streak Week, where we have one episode a day from last Sunday to this upcoming Sunday. And today's episode, episode 159, is with David Jablonski, who's the beat writer for Dayton Flyers and photographer for the Dayton Daily News, also covering the Wittenberg Tigers, Cincinnati Reds, and OSU football. Definitely a fun interview. All eight of these interviews were great, and I enjoyed each and every one of them. That's why we're releasing them one a day on Streak Week. And without further ado, episode 159 on this Wednesday, June 17th, 2020. 12 Ounce Sports. Quench your sports thirst. Articles, live shows, and podcasts. Visit 12ozsportsradio.com. Hey folks, this is Lee W. Mowen of the Cincinnati and Dayton Sports Podcast, and I'm here to talk to you about my bookie. Since 2014, it's the place where you can bet on anything, anywhere, anytime. Get up to $1,000 on your first deposit bonus. Use the promo code 12OZSports. As well as sports betting, you can play some casino games, take in some live odds in Madden 20 and NBA 2K20, and even bet with Bitcoin. Visit mybookie.ag and use that promo code 12OZSports. That's 12OZSports, my bookie, the industry's most rewarding loyalty program. It's episode 159 of the Cincinnati and Dayton Sports Podcast. Our special guest is David Jablonski, the Dayton Flyers beat writer and photographer for the Dayton Daily News. David also covers the Wittenberg Tigers and Cincinnati Reds for the Springfield News Sun and Hamilton Journal News. We're talking local sports, David's journalism career, how special the Flyers were this past season, and more on episode 159. Welcome to the Cincinnati and Dayton Sports Podcast with Lee W. Mowen. This is a weekly podcast covering all sports in Cincinnati and Dayton, Ohio. From Lima to the Ohio River and Northern Kentucky, from Eastern Indiana to Madison County and all points in between, this is your source of local Cincinnati and Dayton, Ohio sports. Visit the LeeWMowen.com slash podcast to find your favorite podcasting platform. Music created with the Splash app. Time for another episode with your host, Lee W. Mowen. And on the phone right now is David Jablonski, the Dayton Flyers beat writer and photographer, and also writer for Wittenberg Tigers and Cincinnati Reds. David, how are you doing today? All right, uh, just got my car fixed. Good to roll. Uh, I'm glad to talk to you. I'm glad. Uh, that you were able to, and thank you for your time today. So let's get started. Where are you from? Well, I grew up in, uh, I was born in Toledo, but I grew up in Mount Rumble, Ohio, which is uh, about a 45-minute drive from uh, downtown Cincinnati, uh, way far east side out in the country, um, east of Cincinnati. And I went to high school in Fayetteville, Ohio, which is uh, south of Wilmington, a very small high school. We had about 190 kids when I was in school. In fact, just now organizing our 25th reunion tells you a little bit how, how old I am, uh, almost 43. Um, so, uh, you know, one stop like town, say it was, but I, I love it there. Uh, great place to grow up. And, you know, we're close enough to Cincinnati to, to experience the glory years of uh, some Cincinnati sports uh, teams. Uh, they were a long time ago. How did you find yourself in Dayton from the Cincinnati area? 
Well, I've been with the Cox Company for 19 years, since 2001. Um, my first job out of uh, after graduating from Ohio University was in uh, Vero Beach, Florida, uh, where the Dodgers had spring training at the time, the famous Dodger Town. It was still there at the time. Uh, they moved to Arizona a few years after that. I left, but uh, I was there for about two years, so I got the experience of two spring trainings. But I was looking to come back to Ohio. As I mentioned, you know, grew up there. Family is all from the – most of my family is from the Dayton area. Both my parents went to Alter High School. So, you know, I was just looking for a job back in Ohio. I wanted to be close to family, and I found a job at the, the Springfield New Sun in 2001 um, covering Wittenberg football. In fact, you know, one of my first job, first stories, I think, was uh, probably on the recruiting class in 2001. I talked to the coach, Joe Fincham. And I've been doing that story, and I just almost finished it today uh, for about 19 or 20 seasons, whatever, however many seasons we're at now. Uh, kind of crazy. I've been covering Whitford football that long. So, uh, yeah, that's that's how I got into the company. And, of course, you know, Springfield was part of Cox back then and still is. But we were pretty much separate newspapers back then. You know, we shared stories of the same company. But, you know, we had a full sports staff of, you know, three or four sports writers. And Dayton had a huge sports staff back then. Uh, but, you know, in 2012, they really uh, revamped the staff, and that's how I kind of came up, came to be doing more Dayton Daily News stuff and started covering Wright State and the Flyers. What is it like covering Wittenberg sports? Um, I've always loved covering uh, the Division Three level. Uh, the only thing is there are fewer, fewer people who care. It's a very smaller fan base, so a lot of times you're writing for, you know, the players and their parents. Um, but, you know, the people who do care are passionate and got a great tradition great history has won national championships consistently in the top 25 great rivalries uh on the football and basketball side football with Wabash, uh basketball with Wooster, uh great storylines and great athletes really i mean sometimes they're uh not as tall or not as big but uh you know a lot of guys who could have played at the division one level i've seen at wittenberg over the years and you know, and the, the coach is fun to talk to on um, both sides. Uh, Joe Fincham right now, Matt Kersey, the basketball coach, mm-hmm. Bill Brown before him. So you really get to know the people uh, from doing it for so long. So that's that's another plus of, and one reason I've loved covering Whitberg over the years. When did you decide that you wanted to become a journalist? Probably not until late in my junior year of high school or might have been even at the beginning of my senior year. Uh, I was kind of – I've always loved sports. I was looking at a way to get into sports in some way. That was either going to be maybe sports medicine, because my dad's a doctor, so I grew up around uh, the medical field to a certain extent, um, or journalism. But I had no connections to the journalism world. Didn't know anything about it, really, other than, you know, I grew up reading Sports Illustrated, grew up reading newspapers. So little did I know, I was kind of training for a career in journalism. In fact, you know, we had season tickets to uh, UC basketball during the glory years of the Huggins era. And my dad and I and my brothers, we would go to, you know, all the home games for like, you know, throughout my high school career and a lot of the road games too. We went to every great Midwest conference tournament. My dad and I went to Hawaii to cover or to, to, to see the uh, rainbow invitational with a senior in high school. And little did I know I was kind of training for a, a career where I've been lucky to do that for a long time now, especially on the Flyers beat, having been to, you know, just been to the Maui Invitational last year and uh, many A-10 tournaments. Um, so I wanted to get into sports in some way, but journalism was really a leap of faith because I'd never written anything, didn't know anyone in the field, and, uh, you know, had no idea what it would take. Uh, I knew how hard it was going to be, especially early in my career. I don't know what I would have thought, but uh, I'm glad I made the choice I did. You mentioned Wittenberg, but when was your first season covering the Dayton Flyers? So I mentioned they uh, revamped our sports staff. and moved, They moved a bunch of us writers to news positions in uh, 2012. So um, I was still covering Wittenberg and had a lot of high school sports in Springfield at the time, which I still do. I still cover a lot of high school stuff. Uh, so they um, gave me some new beats, including covering the Dayton Dragons in the 2012 uh, season. And I also started covering Wright State basketball and other Wright State sports that year. So I spent a year on the right state beat, and then Doug Harris, the longtime uh, uh, UD beat writer for the Dayton Daily News, um, retired right before the 2013-14 uh, season, like week, weeks before. Uh, in fact, Billy Donald, the right state coach, you know, 
they had knew it, known about it before me because they, I remember talking to him and he said, hey, I heard there's a bad rumor you're going to start covering the Flyers to the Raiders. I'm like, well, I didn't heard anything about that. But it, not too long later, they told me that they were switching me to the Dayton beat. Uh, I got on there just in time to, uh, you know, cover the entire uh, Elite Eight season. Uh, in fact, the only games I weren't at, wasn't at that year where it wasn't the Maui Invitational. We just didn't know it was, didn't think it was worth, you know, sending a new rider for that tournament. I'm sure if we knew they were going to, known they were going to the Elite Eight, we probably would have been there. Uh, and I had to fight to get us, to get me to go last year, which I'm glad we did because it was a historic season. So, yeah, that was the first season, so I've covered uh, seven seasons now. How special was both the Dayton run and the Wittenberg run this year in men's basketball? Yeah, it's, uh, they both had great seasons. I mean, I don't, I didn't get to go to many Wittenberg games. Like, I went to two games. Uh, you know, whenever there a couple more times, uh, talk to guys, coach in practice. So I can't say I was you know, all over that beat. It's just possible when you're covering the Flyers, and that is our number one priority as a paper, I would say, because it gets more eyeballs. There's the, the Dayton stories get more eyeballs than any other story, with, uh, from my experience. So that is my number one priority, uh, even even in the off season. Um, and it was just, it was an amazing season, obviously. 2092. You, know, you, you hate to say it's a once in a lifetime season because I'm sure Dayton fans hope they hadn't experienced something like that or something similar again and soon. And then certainly a program capable of doing that. But you know, you throw in on the Obi Toppin Player of the Year thing and um, just rebounding from two subpar seasons, uh, getting to number three in the rankings. It, it's hard to imagine a season quite like that coming together again. I think they can be really good again, but uh, this was uh, probably peak date. And uh, it was really a joyride from start to finish. You know, usually fans have something to gripe about, even even when the team is doing great. And they always come to me for questions or complaints about, you know, did Anthony Grant call them timeouts or what's wrong with this guy? Is he hurt? Uh, things like that. But there was only a couple down moments in the whole season. I mean, the loss to, to Kansas, but, you know, even that wasn't a big deal because, you know, you took one of the nation's top TV teams to overtime. Uh, the loss to Colorado on the buzzer beater was a dagger. That, that hurt a lot of fans. Uh, Chase Johnson leaving the team was probably the other small piece of bad, or I should say small piece, but bad piece of bad news. Um, but other than that, I mean, not much to complain about until March 12th when it all came crashing down. And that leads to my next question. How heartbreaking was it that Dayton not only didn't get a chance to win the A-10 tournament, but get to participate in March Madness? Yeah, it was, it was crazy. Even looking back on it, it's hard to believe it happened because you know, March 7th was one of the probably the, one of the great days in Dayton basketball history. You had ESPN game day on campus, everybody going crazy for that. You had the you know the Dayton women's team playing in the A-10 tournament in the afternoon at UD Arena and winning and uh, they would went on, go on to win that tournament the next day. And then you had uh, senior night against GW that night, Saturday night, March 7th. And Dayton just walked them in the second half. It would be topping three crazy dunks in a row. He couldn't have written a better script, especially for uh, Ryan Mikesell and Trey Landers, the two seniors. Um, great celebration on the floor after the game. There were speeches by Mikesell and Landers and Anthony Grant. And nobody saw what was coming just five days later. I mean, we knew about the coronavirus. Uh, we knew it was, you know, out there and getting worse, but it's just amazing how fast things moved in the next couple of days. I think the Ivy League canceling its tournament started the ball rolling. Uh, but the big thing was the NBA canceling its spending or that midseason at that point on, uh, that Wednesday night, late at night. I mean, the Flyers were already in Brooklyn. I was, I had my bags packed to leave the next morning. And at that point, I kind of figured, you know, there were, there's not going to be an A-10 tournament. The NBA is canceling their seasons. But but uh, I still got on the plane the next morning, went to Brooklyn, and I was on the, an Uber ride to the airport when uh, the tournament officially got canceled. <laughs> an Uber ride to the arena, I should say. So I walked into the Barclays Center probably 10 minutes before the press conference uh, announcing the tournament's cancellation was held. So I was at least you know able to make the most of my trip, I guess. But uh, it was a pretty sad day, and really it hit me till later that night. To, you know, just wanted wanted to after I'd done all my stories, what just had transpired. You know, I talked to Obi's mom, I talked to Ryan Michael's dad, we talked to Neil Sullivan, the uh, AD outside the arena, and it's just unbelievable. It was hard to process uh, how fast uh, 
uh, things fell apart and um, just how much state and uh, it, all its fans lost uh, with the cancellation of the season. It's hard to believe that Flyer fans <laughs> and the like were on cloud nine, you know, cutting down the nets, winning, you know, the regular season title, and then looking forward to the tournament, and then bam, it's canceled just like that. It's something that's never really happened before, and now you know, we're still in the middle of the quarantine. Yeah, um, it'll be something we write about, or I write about for the rest of my career, as long as I'm covering the Flyers. Um, I'm, I grew, like I mentioned, I'm, I grew up a UC fan, so I remember that 2000 team uh, well when Kenya Martin broke his leg and everybody was talking about Bearcats winning a national title. And I still see stories coming out every year or two about the great what if that program has. And now, you know, Dayton is in the same category. Um, you know, one of the biggest Dayton fans, uh, John Raponi, told me after that, uh, on March 12th, after the cancellation, the three worst moments in his uh, Dayton uh, fan career were, you know, the death of Chris Wright, 1996, death of Chris or Steve McIlvain in 2016, and uh, and this story, which, you know, you don't compare to those two stories, but it's uh, still heartbreaking in its own way. Absolutely. Now, you mentioned that you've done a lot of writing, but you also uh, take pictures. You're a photographer for uh, the DDN. Uh, what's that like, being able to take pictures of sporting events? Well, that was kind of a unexpected bonus. I didn't expect to ever be a photographer. Um, never took a class. You know, it was never thought about when I was in school, for sure. Uh, we didn't have the internet, uh, much of the internet back then in the late 90s. I mean, we had a website at the student paper at OU, but, uh, you know, you were still writing for the newspaper. You weren't writing for the website. And, you know, that was the case for many years earlier in my career. We had a website, but it was more of an afterthought. And then, you know, probably five, six, seven years ago, I don't know how, when, but uh, the website became a much bigger emphasis. And now I'm, I feel like I'm writing more for the website than the newspaper. So um, the photography came about because we started shooting video first in uh, 2007 at the New Sun. We got the ability to put videos on our website and I, I just, you know, always uh, enjoyed it. Uh, I remember the, you know, the first videos I shot were when uh, the Kenton Ridge high school baseball team made it to the state championship game in 2007 Adam Eaton was a senior on that team. He's now a, you know, a veteran outfielder, played for the national, plays for the Nationals, assuming there's going to be baseball this season. I won a World Series last year and had a great uh, World Series, and he was a senior on that team in 2007. I remember just you know, shooting video the entire game and putting highlights together after the game, and uh, you, know, you attach it to the top of your story. And uh, I started doing that for every game I went to, all the high school games, all the Wittenberg games. Um, and eventually I, you know, I started shooting photos too, with the same camera, you could do video and photos at the same time, but it wasn't until, uh, 2013, the year I covered Wright state that uh, I got a real, uh, DLSR camera, you know, a professional camera. My wife, Barbara was a photographer at the, the new sun at the same time. That's where we met. Um, so she helped me, uh, you know, learn the basics, but I was able to learn a lot by uh, trial and error, you know, didn't have to worry about film. So you could shoot as much as you want on a digital camera. A lot of bad shots, but some good ones. And eventually there were more bad, more good shots than bad ones. So, um, you know, I learned on the fly, started covering the Reds in the uh, 2013 season, really at the end of the 2012 season, but I didn't have a camera then. And the next season, um, you know, I used the, ca the camera was my way out of the press box and down to the field. You can uh, shoot photos on each side of the Reds dugout. So it was almost, I've compared it over the years to uh, like learning a foreign language when you immerse yourself in a, in a different country, you have to learn fast. And that's kind of what I did uh, when I was shooting the Reds because I sh probably shot 60 games that year, uh, you know, in various levels of lights with different clouds, uh, different, you know, so sometimes the cloud goes in front of the sun. You got to figure out your settings. And so I learned real fast and I've uh, been doing it ever since and really like doing it. Gets me closer to the action. Uh, I don't have to learn, worry about uh, asking a photographer to do things for me, do it myself. And uh, now, you know, for many years, I've also shot videos and photos at the same time with a special contraption I created that basically attaches my cell phone to the end of the camera lens. So if you ever watch the Flyers games and see my coverage, you'll notice I got photos and videos of all the big plays. And that's because I'm doing both at the same time while writing, too. And I just, I just love I love doing all three of that, like in a one man band, so to speak. It's very impressive being able to write and take videos and photos at the same time. Yeah, it's fun and, and gives you, a, you know, an extra layer of uh, reporting because I can look at the video right away and say, oh, did he step out of bounds there? Or, 
it was that shot you know did he make that shot in time before the buzzer or you know was that a foul charge or block <laughs> i do a lot of those videos and you see um, if you see on twitter during especially during a flyers game i'm just like posting videos uh, as fast as i can after a play assuming the, well, the wi-fi is good um because it's really easy to transfer um to do a video sometimes i'll do photos too um but it's just faster because i can just take my cell phone off the camera lens and post it to twitter and i got something real fast you got a very large following on twitter and you also have a couple of uh, contests throughout uh, the flyer season uh tell me right. some of your, tell me some of your favorite parts about interacting with the flyers fans and just overall being on twitter during basketball season yeah i just try to be original i think that you know the, the contest uh you know, I never, I'd not seen anybody else doing that, so I thought it was one different thing I could do. Had all the photos. Uh, you know, most writers don't have the photos to offer to their fans. So, you know, I started doing the guest list. I think I maybe started with a bracket contest at the A-10 tournament for my first or second year, and that's that's kind of got the ball rolling. But I had – the prizes were real simple because it's it's really cheap to uh, buy four by six prints and mail them to people. I don't ask the company to pay for that. I just pay it out of my pocket. But, you know, I probably spent just a couple hundred dollars in seven years. Not a, not not very much money to, to spend to, uh, you know, to inter- to give you an extra way of interacting with fans and reward the fans who follow you and retweet you and, uh, you know, make it so much fun. So it was just – that's kind of how it developed. And um, the last couple of years, I started doing it almost every game, at least during conference season, uh, I guess the score contest. And, you know, I might get 100 people playing along. Um, but a lot of people have won over the years, and I'll send them a selection of photos from really uh last seven years. Or if they've already won, maybe it'll be just the, the most current photos. Uh, but I got a big stack of four-by-six prints at home at all times. and I'm uh, always finding ways to – to get rid of them or send them to fans. Um, it's just, it's just kind of an f- extra fun thing to do. It gives makes, it's a positive thing to do on Twitter, which, which as we all know is often a negative place where people are just using are just complaining about things. <laughs> yeah. Social media does tend to run that, negative, especially. Yeah. It right often way. does, but that is really cool. Do you have any favorite moments uh, while doing these contests? Something that will always stick with you and always make you smile or laugh um i don't know uh just uh fun seeing different people win i guess uh and i've been doing it so long now that a couple people have won several times uh the bracket contests are fun because i always get people to help me out um they kind of volunteer to to run the contest because it's it's hard to uh, add up all the scores uh while you're still covered while you're also covering the tournament um and usually i'll give out a bigger prize for that like bought a uh, scoochie smith t-shirt this year to give to a fan a scoochie smith hat a year year ago uh, i guess the other thing i did the probably the most fun thing i did to interact with fans was create a uh, a pickup basketball game which we call the ud twitter pickup basketball showcase just a fancy uh, name i put on it and invite whoever whoever wants to play i just put it out on twitter um we play we've played four years now i think at the uh the bales center just off uh, 35 there in beaver creek um usually get like 15 to 20 guys it's just for fun um and um we play, play like right before the season opener uh, and of course we do our best to document it on social media and take a lot i take a lot of photos and uh give the winning team some prizes so that's another kind of fun thing i've done for uh, or with the ud fans you have a very busy year and you cover a lot of sports what does a typical sports year look like starting with summer you said you uh, uh shoot the reds and you know it, it never stops for you what's that year like yeah the summer is definitely slower because you know the red season is so long and they haven't been good in so long that i've really cut back on how many games i've covered i think the first year i covered them i covered probably 70 or something of the 82 home games and slowly slowly started cutting back and most of that is has to do with the long drive i have to take because i lived in springfield at the time when i started covering the reds then we moved to uh Columbus when my wife got a job at the Columbus Dispatch so really the last uh, six years I've covered the Reds we've lived in Columbus that's you know nearly three hours of driving total um, every time I cover a game so that's not the best use of my time so I've cut back on the Reds to cover maybe 20 to 30 games a year and sometimes I won't even cover them at all after August 1st because football season has started and the Reds are out of contention so it just doesn't make sense for me to to go down there very often um so summers are pretty slow that's when I, usually i take a lot of my vacation 
Uh, this year, obviously, much different. There haven't been any sports since March. Um, so I've taken, I took a week of vacation in April, a week in May. I'm going to take a week in June, probably again in July. I've got a lot of vacation for many years in the company, which is one of the reasons I stayed in the company. Um, but your, yeah, your, your year really uh, revolves around the sports schedule, uh, which I kind of like, like the variety. Um, you know, basketball season is when I do most of my traveling. Um, lots, lots of traveling covering the Flyers. Um, mostly on the East Coast, been to Rhode Island, I don't know how many times, five or six times, New York City a bunch of times, St. Louis every year, Richmond once or twice every year. Uh, you really, uh, you know, you're talking 11 to 13 plane trips a year um, and only a couple that I can drive to, like uh, Duquesne and Pittsburgh uh, and St. Bonaventure. It's about a five-hour drive from Columbus. So uh, that's, a, that's, a bu- that's a busy time of year, and that's also the most important time for me because just as i mentioned the flyers are so popular in dayton um and you know high school sports are also still a big part of what i do so you know and end of may or early june i'm usually covering a lot of high school sports baseball softball state track meet i love covering uh in the fall usually covering a high school football game every friday um cut i cut back a little bit once the basketball season gets going and you know i've covered a lot of Ohio state over the last uh five or six seasons too. Uh, I mean, there was a four year run where I got to go to all the bowl games. I was there when they won the sugar bowl. I was on the sideline for that. I was standing behind the end zone when they won the national championship against Oregon, you know, shooting photos for all those games. And I got to go to the Fiesta bowl twice. Um, so that was, that was a blast. I've kind of cut back on that now, now that we've got a uh, toddler at home because I can't do all the traveling for the bowl games and then travel for the flyers. So, um, fortunately, uh, my bosses are pretty understanding. That does equal a lot of mileage. Uh, my next question is, would you say that winter is your busiest season or would you pick fall just because how much football is available? Well, the busiest season, I guess, would be when the, the two seasons collide mm. in October and November because, you know, you got football season at its most important time and you got a lot of season preview stuff for basketball and, you know, throughout November, both are going on. So um, that is that is probably the hardest time. I guess if March, you know, if they never makes another – run which might have happened this march uh that's also a, a very challenging time too just because just because you don't know how long you're going to be away from home or when you're going to go or where you're going to go um so that's hard on the family life uh dealing with that we had i had all the babysitting set up for uh a10 tournament and the first round of the ncaa tournament in march when everything got canceled so uh i guess the bonus was uh i got to be home with the, the family um but uh certainly would have uh rather been covering uh historic season as it reached its uh, climax yeah i think it was at a dayton flyers baseball game when uh, they finally said no atlantic 10 tournament and of course the big east they were uh, they were at halftime the first game is like nope no more so yeah it was crazy yeah you, all those baseball players i've talked to a bunch of those guys from flyers this spring and, and uh, yeah heartbreaking for a lot of different people yeah i i think that flyer squad you know they finished you know, runners up in the A10 uh, tourney last year. I think they would have had a much stronger squad and a great season this year, but it didn't happen. So, yeah, I just talked to Riley, uh, Toronto, and Cole Pletka the other day because they got back on the field last week uh, at that U.S. or college baseball uh, summer invitational, and I, you know they had to go do all the cotton cotton swabs and or the coronavirus testing with the swab in their nose and they had to do the antibody testing but they were willing to do anything to get back on the field so uh, that's kind of where i think everybody is right now everybody wants to see some sports so uh, you know we're getting closer i think to, to seeing some yeah and also uh two great flyers that have a very solid uh, shot of being drafted in the mlb that's draft. right um, could be today uh riley i mean he kind of expect he said he expected to be like a six to ten round guy but he said he'd been dropped I'm in some draft boards this spring, so it'd be pretty cool if he went uh, yeah. sometime today, especially when considering, uh, you know, Dayton already had a football player drafted this year, Adam Troutman. They're going to have a basketball player drafted in October with Obi Toppin, so it'd be pretty sweet if they, uh, for the Flyers, uh, if they had players in three different sports drafted this year. Absolutely. Would that be a UD first, would you know? I mean, I don't have to look up that to figure that. <laughs> That's got to be a first. I don't know. You never know. They had some guys in the 70s. Uh, in football they just haven't had enough football guys drafted so it would have to be a first uh, but both those guys said you know 
they are happy to come back to Dayton um, if it doesn't work out this year, if they don't get drafted, because I don't think either of them will want, you know, one of the $20,000 deals. Everybody after the first five rounds can sign as a free agent, but there's a limit on how much uh, bonus money they can get. So uh, it'll probably make more sense for them to come back to UD. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not the biggest fan how they did the draft this year. I know coronavirus and everything, but just so few rounds. It just... <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's probably, there's not going to be minor league baseball this year anyway, so it just seems like it would make more sense to come back to school and do it again. It'd be nice to see uh, Tyrata at third base and Pleka on the mound. I mean, Pleka pitched quite well, I think, pitching against Norfolk, Kentucky this uh, this season. So, mm-hmm. But uh, sticking uh, with the draft, uh, Obi Toppin, definitely, uh, definitely a pick. Uh, where do you see him going? I don't know. I've seen him in size, you know, three, I think, in a lot of the mock drafts. I'm going to be doing an update soon on uh, what everybody's saying about him. Um, just a, an odd situation with the, the draft getting moved back from June to to October and the combine. I don't think they've even announced the date for that yet, so I'm sure that'll help determine where he goes. Um, you know, um, he's – I'm sure, you know, what he did in the – I don't think missing the NCAA tournament cost him too much. I mean, he, he won all the awards. I think it, it didn't – it probably helped him win the awards that the tournament was canceled because at that point he was far and away the number one guy and everybody didn't have anything else to go on. So, um, you know, he will, pretty much swept all the national awards. Um, he's definitely going to be a lottery pick, which is a big deal for Dayton. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I would guess he'll be in the top ten. Uh, I don't know if it matters a whole lot, you know, if he's five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I don't know. Probably, probably for him, you know, going to the best team, the team that uh, can use him the most or the best, will be more important than making a few extra dollars. Selfishly, I hope he falls to either the Pacers or Cavaliers, just because, like, hey, yeah, that'd I be cool see. to have him. Uh, I mean, whoever uh, drafts him is going to gain a lot of fans in Dayton. Be a lot of Obi Toppin jerseys uh, I, at the arena next year, assuming there are fans at the games. I feel like it's been a long time since I've seen these articles, but I saw a lot of Obi Toppin to Golden State. Yeah, I think there was some talk about that because his parents did a podcast with uh, Steph Curry's parents, mm. Del Curry and his his wife, and they were talking about, of course, they were, his mom was on there saying, yeah, we want him to play for Golden State, of course. <laughs> um, and it does seem like that would be a team that could, uh, could capitalize on his talents. Absolutely. I mean, they'll have Clay Thompson back. I think Draymond Green will be back. Steph Curry, of course. That that's going to be a pretty lethal team with everyone. And if Obi gets to the Warriors, I I think they might be just as strong as they were when they had uh, Kevin Durant. Yeah, that'd be nice for him uh, to get with a good team for sure. Now back to you. What are some of your favorite stories and pictures and videos that you have? taken and created over your time in with cox media well the big moments the big games um always stand out um you know with the reds covering jake arietta's no hitter was a big one you know i was down in the dugout uh shooting photos of that while you know clicking send on my game story as soon as it was officially a no hitter um you can send out your story by your phone these days so that that's a big help and I remember being in the press conference, and there was nobody else there with a real DLSR camera. So I, you know, shot a portrait of him, and uh, I think David Ross was the catcher, and sent it to the Cubs and let them use it on Twitter. Um, Homer Bailey's no hitter. I was there for that, the second one. Um, lots of lots of big moments and fun moments at Reds games over the years. Although a lot of them kind of irrelevant to the uh, National League Central race because the Reds haven't been in contention very often in my in the, all those years. Yeah. Uh, with the Flyers, obviously their lead eight run, um, you know, being a, under the basket uh, when V. Sanford made his shot against Ohio State, you know, shooting that celebration just a few feet in, and then cl- quickly checking my camera to make sure I've got at least one frame in focus of uh, Sanford's shot. I got a pretty good one, um, you know, going to Memphis and Buffalo that year, you know, always going to be a highlight. Um, lots of big buzzer beaters over the years and just making sure, again, that I got the shot in focus and usually i usually i do it might be only one or two frames but you know like the jalen crutcher shot against st louis last year was a big highlight um 
kind of hard always to get a good uh, angle on a three pointer like that. But I got you know I got one at least one shot that was good enough and. You know, the celebration was at the far end of the court, which wasn't the best for photos, but you kind of run down there real fast and see what you can get. Uh, with, you know, same with Ohio State. The big games are always uh, the ones that stand out. Uh, the Sugar Bowl was a crazy experience um, because it was so close, and it was it was back when we were still getting, you know, late games in the next day's paper where our deadlines have since changed. So anything that really starts after, you know, 5 p.m., there's no way we're getting a game story in the next day's paper when they print us in Indianapolis. But back then, um, you know, we still had a chance to get the game story in the paper with the final score. So my goal or my job was to have a game story immediately ready as soon as that final, uh, you know, buzzer sounded. But it was challenging that game because that game was back and forth and you didn't know who was going to win. Uh, you know, the national championship game was the same thing, but Ohio State kind of had that one sewn up, you know, by late in the third quarter. So I kind of wrote that story ahead of time and my boss can just click send at the end you want something on the website right away. But with, with the Alabama game, I was running back and forth between the field and my laptop, which is in a photo room just off the field, and trying to do my best to get, you know, photos of all the big plays. But I missed the big Ezekiel Elliott, the famous run. You know, I was shoot, shooting that from behind on the other side of the field uh, because I had just, you know, updated my game story. Um, so, you know, typically you'd want to be in front of the offense, especially, you know, an offense that can score on any play. You know, Ezekiel Elliott could take off at any moment score and I, I knew that but i just didn't have time to get in front of it um so uh, yeah that was a, a shot i missed i have him from behind um but a lot of good shots from the celebration of course same in the national championship game against oregon a lot of big high state games over the year the braxton miller spin move you know i had a perfect some perfect shots of that uh at the virginia tech game uh, you know that big comeback against penn state a few years ago uh, i think when jt barrett threw the big pass to uh was it marcus ball can't remember um, lots of big moments, you know, those are the ones that stand out, um, similar with Wittenberg and then all the high school sports, you know, those can be just as exciting too. If, if, even if there's not as many fans in the stands. I think one of my favorite uh, pictures was, uh, the Flyers win over Ohio state in their elite eight run. Uh, it was just right over the hoop and everything. It was, it was great. It's even hanging up in the, uh, doctor's office in Farmersville with that it's is that the one up there in craft laying on the ground yes that's, yeah that's yeah. my favorite uh, i don't know i forget who shot that one but uh I'm, I'm not confident enough as a photographer to put a camera on the ceiling <laughs> fair. you have to have some real technical expertise to do that um fair so I, I try i try to keep it simple and uh just stick to my spot although i move around the arenas a lot to get different angles so uh, sometimes you'll see some stuff from above and um just uh, trying to vary it a little bit. How much, as a photographer, do you move during a game, whether it be football, basketball, <laughs> baseball? How much do you have to get up, move, and you know, re reset everything? Football, you move the most because, like I said, you want to be in front of the offense usually. Mm-hmm. Um, depending on who you're, I mean, at least if you're covering a high state, you want to be in front of their offense. Mm-hmm. Defense kind of can go either way there. Um, so you're constantly charging up and down the sidelines with heavy cameras. That's a pretty good workout. Uh, baseball, you can, at the Reds games, you can be one of four places, basically. I've shot from the stands a few times just for to vary it, but usually you're on the field on each side of the dugout. So I might switch once an inning. And Reds games, depending on the game, I might only shoot four innings because I've still got to work on my stories. Two, um um, you know, if it's a close game, I might go back down for the ninth inning or something like that. Um, but, uh, you know, basketball, typically I'm only in one spot by the basket. Um, usually at UD games, at UD Arena, I will move up into the stands uh, between the levels for like the last four minutes of the, the first half or something like that um, just to get some different shots and different angles. But uh, I like to be back – close to the basket because I, as i mentioned I, I shoot the video and it only really works if you're close up um every time the flyers are coming at me on offense i'll hit record on my cell phone and just let it roll as i shoot photos so uh, that's my goal uh, so depends on the game too if it's a blowout i might move around more often i've shot from the, the flight deck way up above um you know when they go to the conference tournaments at the berkeley center or wherever you know oftentimes i'll move around a lot there because there's a lot of open seats at those events i see 
Now, we talked a lot of football, basketball, baseball, but is there any other sport that you want to either write about or take pictures at? Um, soccer was always my favorite sport uh, growing up just because it was the best sport uh, I was at as far as playing. Um, so, you know, I really like covering high school soccer. I don't get to do it much anymore. Um, but I guess covering the World Cup would, would be a dream. Maybe uh, 2026, we'll see what's going on then. My kid will be eight years old. I plan to take a big road trip with him if I can at that point and watch some games that I don't know if I'll be covering them. We'll see. It's a long way away. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it doesn't really, the sport doesn't matter really as much as the event. Like, you know, the state track and field meet is one of the most exciting things to shoot every year just because, especially on that Saturday, you got hours and hours of great moments one after the other right at the finish line and big moments for these kids and that's always very exciting and, you know the state wrestling me which i've covered a couple of times for the same reason is very excited exciting um you know as are all the state championship games i've covered i think i've only covered one football state championship game when uh shawnee high school from springfield played in uh, in canton um but i've covered the basketball championship a couple of times uh so those are always very exciting now, what is track and field like, like in terms of taking pictures and writing stories? Well, it's like the state meet, for instance, is two days. Got a lot of the preliminaries on Friday and the finals on Saturday. And usually I have, you know, a lot of athletes, but usually we split it up. Um, you know, I'll focus on the Springfield area guys and Mark Pendleton, who just retired, would have focused on the Dayton guys. I don't know what we would, how we would have covered it this year. So he's no longer there. We probably had some help with freelancers, hmm. but um, it's it's like covering like ten car crashes all at once because <laughs> got all these different athletes at different parts of the stadium, some outside the stadium with the throwing events, and you're trying to figure out where to be, uh, who's the most important, you know, who has the chance to win, and then at the end you gotta you know figure out how to put it all into one story while, with a you know a large photo gallery too. So. It is one of the hardest days, and it's always really hot, too. So uh, yeah. I think uh, it would have been held last weekend if it would have happened this, this year. Obviously, it didn't because of the pandemic. But uh, uh, even though it's hard, it's a lot of fun. David, what are some of your favorite things about sports locally in the area? I think it's just getting to know the different uh, athletes and coaches over the years. Um, you know, you like the Flyers, you know, it could take three to four three to four years to really get to know a guy where they, you know, you're on a first name basis with them, you know, Scoochie Smith, Kyle Davis, Kendall Pollard. I feel like I, you know, got to know those guys real well because they were such central figures for the team, you know, four years in a row. Uh, Obi, you know, he was only there for three seasons, only two seasons on the court, but, you know, he was a guy that was just so going, you know, when he saw me, he would always ask about my kid, how he was doing, went to the game in Philadelphia with my wife and kid, uh, Obi saw me holding him and I was just kind of walking him around the arena, showing him the basketball, you know, he's only about 18 months old at that point. And Obi's like, Oh, he was real excited to see him. You know, that's pretty rare for a, you know, an athlete. Uh, usually they're in their own, own little bubble. And especially reporters are, you know, they know them, but they, you know, they, they're not going to often ask to hold your kid like Obi did. So I was like, Oh sure. Yeah. And then we got a picture and it was pretty cute. Uh, one of the Dayton uh, radio guys, uh, got on me for that but you know, you know i'm not gonna be asking autographs for a guy from guys but i'm not i mean i'm not gonna be their best friend but if a, if a player wants to hold my uh child and is actually excited to see him i'm not gonna turn that down either you know you gotta you gotta know what you're what moment you're in so uh yeah it's just getting to know the, the coaches and the players i mentioned the wittenberg coach who i've known for you know, almost two decades now um you know a lot of the former flyers you know like the guys who were playing with their in the basketball tournament last year, you know, Devin Oliver, V. Sanford, getting to see people like that again after so many years was cool. Um, so I guess that would be the highlight. Now, what would you like to see in the future for Dayton sports or media? I don't know. I just hope to keep doing them. my job. You know, newspapers are uh, kind of a dying industry, at least in the print side. So uh, you never know what the future will hold. Um, the more people read us than ever, I think, because of the website. Um, but um, it's trying to make money off that website and trying to hold on to the print subscribers to, you know, especially this year, especially everybody's suffering all sorts of businesses. And, you know, even though everybody's reading the Dane Daily News, we've certainly lost some advertising money, which um, 
which hurts. So I just hope to keep doing um, my job. It's kind of a a dream job because, uh, you know, I've got a lot of connections to the Dayton area. My grandpa was a huge Flyers fan who took me to a couple games when I was little. Mm-hmm. Um, um, my great-grandpa was a dean at the university. Um, so even though I didn't grow up rooting for the Flyers because the mid-'90s were not a great time for the Flyers. Mm-hmm. So even if they had been really good, I don't know if I would have been a fan because the Bearcats were so good at that time. But, um, um, yeah, and we'll see. I just hope to keep doing my job and hope it doesn't change too much. Uh, if it does change, I hope it's for the better because the Internet has certainly changed things. But for me, it's been for the better because you can do so many different things and, um, you know, connect with fans in a way you couldn't have done 15 years ago. And also the interaction that you get as well that's people that follow you and see your content. Yeah, it's good and bad, but I shared a uh, piece of hate mail I got today from a, uh, a very uh, loyal troll who likes to send me uh, nasty emails for no good reason, um, even though I've blocked his email address and I've never responded. Uh, this time I was like, oh, I'm just going to screenshot his email and share it on Twitter just to laugh, just give people a laugh. Um, but mostly it's it's real positive. Uh, that that kind of thing is uh, is rare for me at least. And part of it is because I don't, go back and forth with fans too much you see a lot of sports writers who get into back and forth and back and you know if they don't like what a fan says and i i will most likely tend to ignore, ignore you or just mute you mute you on twitter if you are annoying me so uh, uh i don't come out looking like a jerk yeah i mean people can be jerks like that it's you know with social media one of the bad things too it, it gives people you know a voice and they use it the wrong way yeah it's just like everything i mean don't read the comments you know it's hard to ignore sometimes but you got to let it roll off now for those that want to join the journalism field or become a photographer uh, what advice can you give well um consider what you're getting into i mean it is a uh challenging industry right now and you probably say that about a lot of different professions but mm-hmm. um just know i mean there's there are some more opportunities because of social media but certainly in a print newspaper journalism um many many fewer jobs than there used to be when i got into the business um in 19 well my first stories were in 96 for the student paper but my first full-time job was 99 after i graduated and you know even then it wasn't easy i had to get do three internships before I got a you know full time job. So yeah, if you can get some experience is the important thing. Uh, you know, write for your high school newspaper, write for your college newspaper. Go after internships. Uh, hopefully, they're paid internships. Not all of them are. Um, you know, seek out sports writers, sports editors. See if they need any freelance help. You know, we always need help with, um, especially high school sports. We're always looking for good people to help there. Um, doesn't pay a whole lot, but it does pay something. And then, you know, if you need to get your foot in the, the door and get some clips, uh, that's, that's, that's a huge thing. Uh, I didn't even have that in high school. So if you could do that early on, you're going to be way ahead of the field. Um, and, you know, take a good journalism school. Ohio University did a great job helping me land internships and student paper. You know, we had a ton of freedom to do, to do things we wanted to do and experiment with writing and laying out pages and doing all that. So, um, you know, and talk to people. It's so easy to reach out to uh, journalists these days through direct messages and things like that. And I've always uh, tried to to give back by uh, getting back to whoever contacts me. I usually have, you know, one or two students every year who shadow me at uh, you know D, at UD games or or wherever. And um, hopefully uh, they've benefited from that. How can people follow you, your work, and maybe get in some of the fun on social media? Um, both my Twitter and Instagram handles are the same. David P. Zimpatrick, Jablonski, all uh, together, lowercase. So pretty easy to find. There are a couple of other David Jablonski. Actually, there's a lot of David Jablonskis out there. It's not that hmm. as uncommon a name as you think, including a science, famous scientist who's the first guy who comes up. But if you Google me, Dayton Daly, you should be able to find me pretty easy. David, thanks for your time today. It's been a lot of fun. It's been a lot of fun learning about you. All right. Well, good luck uh, with the podcast. I look forward to to sharing uh, the link when you send it out and look forward to to what you produce in the future. Thank you, David. And here's here's the basketball, college basketball in 2020. Hopefully we have. Uh, I hope so. Let's hope so. 
And that will close out episode 159 of the Cincinnati Dayton Sports Podcast. Talk to you again for episode 160. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Cincinnati and Dayton Sports Podcast with Lee W. Mowen. To subscribe to the podcast, please visit the leewmowen.com slash podcast. From there, you can choose your favorite platform, such as Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, TuneIn, Spotify, the iHeartRadio app, and many more. Interact with the podcast and host on Twitter at the Lee W. Mallon and at Sunday Pod. Like the Facebook page, the Cincinnati and Dayton Sports Podcast, and download the free Flick Chat app, then search for the local Sunday sports group to submit your future Mowen's Mailbag questions. The closing theme is Lights Go Down by Dan Hennig, provided by the YouTube Music Library Collection. This is Lee W. Mowen, and I hope you enjoyed this week's podcast. Please join me again next week on the Cincinnati and Dayton Sports Podcast. <laughs>